The year is 1999 and I'm home from college. I convince my parents that we need to go to the movie theater to see this newly released film, The Blair Witch Project. As someone interested in low-budget filmmaking, I've been following the story of Blair Witch's making for a long time. Ever since I caught a few minutes of preview footage on an independent film channel show, where it was presented as possibly being real documentary footage. This approach to blurring the line between storytelling and reality, making the real-world release of the film into a part of the narrative itself, was mind-blowing, and I wanted to experience it firsthand. And also, the newly-minted theater major inside of me wanted to experience a movie that had no script, where the actors improvised their way through a world that was being created around them by the filmmakers. My parents did not really share my passion for the horror genre, but they had seen enough about the movie to be interested in seeing how it turned out, too. We went to our local Cinemark, and for an hour and 21 minutes, I was transfixed by what I saw on the screen. It felt raw, it felt real, it felt convincing. I left the theater practically in a daze, and my father was shaken by the movie, too. We stood for a second talking about how the film was just so unsettling until my mother joined us in the hall. When we told her we were thinking of maybe getting a ticket to another movie just to shake off the effect of the one we had just seen, she looked straight at us and said, Wait, are you being serious right now? It took her less than 10 minutes to poke so many holes in the story and the reality of what we had just seen that the effect dissipated, and the Blair Witch Project suddenly seemed like just another B-movie horror film. And the vast majority of the points she made were, to put it bluntly, right. Dan and I were two people who frequently watched TV shows where somber hosts talked about possible hauntings and mysterious goings-on. We were predisposed to immerse ourselves in pseudo-documentary footage and ignore the glaring omissions. My mother, on the other hand, has always had a significantly lower threshold for bullshit. The fascinating thing about this, however, is that I actually still love The Blair Witch Project. I've seen all of the sequels, and after what I just said, you'll either be shocked or utterly unsurprised to learn that Blair Witch 2 Book of Shadows, the one that is just a straight-up movie without any of the found footage elements, is my favorite installment in the series. And I've generally kept tabs on the franchise as it's gone along. But more so than the movies, I've always been enchanted by the world that it built. There's a whole mythology that exists beyond the confines of the movie, full of terrifying creatures and concepts, and no matter what else gets introduced, we're always assured that, no matter what, the Blair Witch is the scariest of them all. Found footage films did not begin with the Blair Witch. That honor is often attributed, instead, to 1980's Cannibal Holocaust, a highly controversial mutation of the Italian Mondo Cinema movement that claimed to be edited together from the footage that was recovered from a lost documentary team. Even that, however, does not appear to have been the first instance. 1961's The Connection, directed by Shirley Clark, adapted Jack Gelber's stage play of the same name as a series of film vignettes that were supposedly taken from the footage of disappeared fictional documentary filmmaker Jim Dunn, as it told the story of heroin addicts waiting for their dealer to arrive. But the storytelling format that The Connection seems to have originated 
would explode following Daniel Myrick and Eduardo Sanchez's Blair Witch. The duo had been hoping to be able to sell their movie to cable, but instead it received a theatrical release from Artisan Entertainment. Blair Witch dragged the format of found footage in front of mainstream audiences, and mainstream film production companies liked the sound of $248.6 million worldwide box office on a production budget of around $60,000. Following the spate of parodies of all shapes and sizes, including 2000's The Bear Wench Project, directed by the return of Swamp Thing's Jim Wynorski and starring Julie Strain, which has four sequels of its own, Criterion Collection, if you're listening, this needs a Blu-ray box set release. The format would be adopted to tell stories of almost every genre by filmmakers like Zach Penn, George Romero, Neil Blomkamp, and J.J. Abrams, who, by the way, only produced Cloverfield. It was directed by Felicity alum Matt Reeves. But no genre seems to have adopted the format quite as thoroughly as the horror genre. And why not? Horror has always thrived at the intersection between immersive storytelling and super cheap filmmaking. After all, few things rattle your nerves like a really good scary story told by the side of a campfire. But it's also hard to get millions of people worldwide to line up all at once to pay you $15 a pop for the privilege. It's also fascinating to me to note when found footage exploded as a storytelling form. When the Blair Witch Project released to theaters, DVDs were just beginning to share shelf space worldwide with VHS. Japan had a head start on the format and had total market dominance practically from DVD's launch in 1996. The U.S. was still releasing movies on both DVD and video cassette, and would until around 2003 when DVDs would overtake VHS in rentals for the first time. And for the rest of the world, DVD was fresh on the market, having finally been launched worldwide in 1998. Pristine, perfect digital copies were just becoming normal for consumers who had previously been used to watching movies at home on analog formats with all of the blurred edges, low resolution, and potential tape damage that accompanied it. If you watched The Blair Witch Project, it was filmed without digital media of any kind. The footage was either captured on 16mm film or on Hi8 video camcorders, analog tape. The tape-based Digital 8 format would release literally the same year that Blair Witch hit theaters. And the availability of high-quality cameras has trended upward steadily ever since, to the point that you more than likely carry a camera capable of shooting footage better than anything used in the production of the Blair Witch Project in your pocket every day. With the end of the HD format wars in 2008, Blu-ray meant that people could now watch movies at home in crystal clear 1080p and many people, myself included, I have to admit, saw analog home formats like VHS as dead and unlamented media that had served its purpose in its time but surely wouldn't hold any value in the future. It turns out we were wrong. Art is a highly subjective product, and people like what they like. There is, ultimately, no objective way to speak to an individual's taste. Lines of resolution, color accuracy, sharpness of focus, fidelity of reproduction, they may all speak to a higher quality of format, but they don't matter when an entire generation remembers sitting on the couch with a bowl of buttered popcorn and watching the old VHS of Ghostbusters that they rented off the wall at the Curtis Mathis. Yes, I'm talking about even before Blockbuster. 
While not all nostalgia is great, neither is all nostalgia toxic, and a lot of people love that analog feel, even more than picking up weird VHS tapes on Friday night for your weekend rental, however, people who grew up during that era have fond memories of pre-digital local television. Las Vegas is watching Full House right here on Channel 13. The channel graphics that always tried to impress you with how futuristic they were. The commercial breaks dotted with program listings for the upcoming three or four shows, the strange late-night programs that you'd find on local television, all occasionally captured on your home VHS set, these are powerful images to the audience who was raised on cathode ray tubes. And to audiences who have grown up in the era of pristine digital, where 1080p is already low resolution, they evoke the feel of a long-forgotten relic dredged up from some forgotten archive. A VHS in a generic cardboard sleeve labeled with a post-it note is the modern era's reel-to-reel -reel tape found in a cabin in the woods. Which was the 1980s equivalent to 1940s horror's handwritten book bound in human skin? Who knows what you'll find? It might be great-grandma's favorite recipes. It might be a doorway to a dimension crafted entirely from suffering, or it might be two old naked people doing it. The possibilities are literally endless. In 2013, this nostalgia for the analog broadcast and magnetic tape days collided headfirst with the exploding found footage scene when the team of Chris LaMartina, James Branscombe, Sean Jones, Scott McCubbin, Lonnie Martin, Matthew Mentor, and Andy Shubb directed WNUF Halloween Special. It drops the typical found footage backstory of being the recovered footage of a lost documentary crew or being footage filmed by a missing person and instead takes on the shape of a locally produced Halloween special from a television station that, we are told, originally aired live in 1987 and had been considered lost until a VHS copy was recently discovered. Shot on a budget of only $1,500, the movie captures the feel of an 80s broadcast in spirit, if not in 100% accuracy, with La Martina calling it a love letter to VHS and public access TV. To get that accurate analog feel, La Martina shot much of the film on actual vintage tape stock and, after editing it all together, mastered it to VHS, where he then made a VHS copy of the VHS, and then a VHS copy of that copy, and so on, in order to get a completely realistic loss of picture quality. And in a promotional move that I think is more than comparable to the Blair Witch Project's Is It or Isn't It Whisper campaign, the production team seeded VHS copies of their movie around events, like a Pennsylvania VHS convention, where original tapes of rare and bizarre local programming were likely to be traded and sold. While WNUF Halloween is not exactly like previous found footage movies, it has a lot in common, not the least of which is that it still follows a standard movie story structure. Found footage movies are still movies. Even The Blair Witch Project, presented us with a story that had a clear beginning, middle, and end. Most of the narratives put forth in the format, whether they're tightly scripted or improvised, trace a familiar story arc with characters we as an audience get involved in, and a conclusion that ultimately provides us with some level of closure. But the rise of online video would ultimately bring us something very different. By 2015, Chris Straub was no stranger to online media. 
He had made his debut as a web cartoonist in 2000 with Checkerboard Nightmare, and in 2006, he had partnered with Scott Kurtz to produce animated versions of Kurtz's popular PvP webcomic. He was also very active in the creepypasta community, the internet equivalent of those fireside scary stories, creating one of my personal favorites, Candle Cove, in 2009, which would later become the basis for the first season of Sci-Fi's Channel Zero. In 2015, Straub released two short films that he had edited together using Apple's iMovie software. Weather Service and Contingency first appeared online on their own website. The videos presented are purported online posts from the archive of Mason County, West Virginia's Local 58, with each video seeming to be a moment throughout the years when their broadcast was hijacked by some unknown entity or entities. Whatever it is that's interrupting Local 58's signal, however, it doesn't seem to have our best interests at heart. There had already been experiments in combining the format of found footage storytelling with the open-ended, episodic, short-format storytelling that was becoming common online, such as 2009's Marble Hornets. But with Local 58, Straub coined the term analog horror. CHSS, another foundational analog horror series, would launch the following year on YouTube, and then in 2017, Straub would move Local 58 to the YouTube channel Local 58 TV, where it still resides today, and where countless other analog horror projects have sprung up. While fans have attempted to construct an overarching narrative, and Straub himself has hinted at a deeper story, the individual videos all stand alone as sole moments of the weird and uncanny. And when taken together, they suggest that whatever story you find, the world around it is infinitely larger and stranger. There are many potential definitions for analog horror, but the one that resonates the most with me comes from Pad Chennington's and Aiden Chick's What is Analog Horror? They lay out three core elements. One, it is a form of storytelling depicting a pre-existing medium, such as a videotape or a recorded television broadcast, usually one in an analog form. Second, it does not depict any characters, but it is driven by a second-person perspective. And of course, third, it uses a horror narrative. And here we have a moment where my brain goes to the broken base. What is? What's really going to bake your noodle later on is, would you still have broken it if I hadn't said anything? In many ways, Local 58 and other analog horror channels have achieved what the Blair Witch Project's related media hinted at, but would they exist today if the Blair Witch Project hadn't caused an explosion in interest in the found footage format to begin with? Blair Witch had to fit into a movie narrative and deliver what was expected from a movie. And then it channeled its larger world into tie-in media, books, television specials, video games, all of them with their own expected requirements for their media. This was nothing new. Star Wars had done this, but Blair Witch was building on a horror narrative in this way. But online video has no expectations of format. You can watch a tightly paced, professionally edited product from the Try Guys, or you might stumble across a three-minute video of somebody's kitten playing with a ball of yarn. 
the narrative rules of traditional media do not apply to online media, and analog horror makes use of that. The next video does not have to build on what was previously established. It can move in a direction you're not expecting. You can introduce decades-long gaps in the narrative, and you can make people question whether you even have a narrative at all, or if each moment is a new and terrifying thing making its first ever appearance. And so much of it is, as previously stated, told from the second person. If you don't remember your basic literature, that means it's a story told where the main character is not me or them, but you. You become a witness. You build the story. You seek out the next chapter. You become an active participant in the story, and you dive in as deeply as you wish. Because the potential world in any analog horror creation could stretch out forever. Thanks for checking out the video. What's your favorite analog horror series? Feel free to make some recommendations in the comments. I've also linked a couple of my favorites down in the description. Big thanks to our patrons, Sarah Williams and Michael Mangiapane. If you're in a position financially to help the channel grow, you can find our coffee and Patreon links in the description as well. If you're not, then I'm still happy that you're here with me, and thank you for sticking around. Make sure to click like and subscribe if you haven't already, and feel free to share the video with your friends. It really helps out the channel, and after all, sharing is caring. Until next time, watch like it means something.